Before um, I jump any further, I want to re review some statistics <clears throat> on uh, pension funding in Missouri. These statistics come from the Federal Reserve Board, and I'll explain to you, you know, in, in due course why I'm using the, the Fed's numbers. Um, but these are numbers the, the Fed uses. These come from what are called the National Income and Product Accounts, which are you know, the official accounting statistics for the United States. We calculate these based on agreements with other countries. They'll be consistent with what they do. So these are from the official kind of books of the United States. If we go back to 2002, which is the first, date, uh, first year I had data for, uh, Missouri's state pensions, even when you total them all together, were 53% funded. The unfunded liability uh, at that time was $32.7 billion, which at that, in 2002 was 17% of the state's gross domestic product. It was equal to 107% of the state's annual tax revenues. So it's not as if the state is going to pay off its unfunded liability in one year, but it gives you some idea of how big these unfunded liabilities are relative to the resources available to the state to pay them. Now, instead, let's fast forward to 2016. <clears throat> the funded ratio, according to the Fed, has dropped from 53% to 49%. The unfunded liability more than doubled from $33 billion to $75 billion. And I think even more troubling is the increase in the unfunded liability, it grew faster than either the size of the state economy or of, it grew faster than tax revenues in the state. Uh, the unfunded pension liabilities here in Missouri went from 17% to 25% of state GDP and from 107% to 100%. 43% of state tax revenues. So what this means is the size of these unfunded pension liabilities have increased faster than the ability of Missouri and its economy and its taxpayers to service them. That's, so it doesn't mean you're doomed, you're about to fall off a cliff, but it means you have a significant problem and that the problem is growing in size. And the thing that's kind of even more troubling, and this is something that happens you know, in Missouri, but around the country as well, is those unfunded liabilities are growing even as the contributions we make to the plans have increased. Uh, Mike's slides show the increase in contributions uh, for teacher pension plans. Here in Missouri, I think the, con the total contribution uh, went from $742 million to $1.5 billion over, uh, this is 2001 to 2017. As a percentage of employees' pay, which is how they're often measured, the, the, requ the annual required contribution grew by about 50 percent. So it's growing faster than employees' wages are growing. It's growing faster than tax revenues. When that happens, then that means you're, you either have to essentially raise taxes, you have to squeeze out other things the government does, uh, you have to let your debt grow. So again, it's, it's something that's growing in size over time, and, and it just gets more difficult to deal with. I think it's worth trying to put Missouri in a little bit of context, again, because uh, you hear about this all over, all over the country. Missouri is not Illinois. It's not New Jersey. Those are states which, you know, to be frank, I think are perhaps beyond the tipping point in the sense that the, the states don't have the capacity either politically or financially to truly get on top of the pensions as they're currently structured and get back on top of them. On the other hand, though, uh, you know, uh, Missouri is not well-funded relative to, uh, you know, the national average. Their, their, their unfunded liabilities uh, relative to state GDP are just are slightly higher than the national average. National average 23 percent. Here we're 25 percent. Uh, unfunded uh, pensions here in Missouri were 143 percent of state tax revenues versus 124 percent nationally. So you're not Illinois, but this is not a, you know, an example of a truly well-funded uh, pension plan either. And but I think it's worth looking at, and here we'll get into some of the kind of bigger kind of methodological issues, of why these pensions are, you know, I cited these numbers from the Fed that says the pensions here are less than 50% funded. The question is, you know, why is that number so bad? 
And because if you go to the plans here, they'll tell you, I think Moser says it's around 65% funded. Some of the public uh, teacher plans say they're 84, 85% funded. Why is the Federal Reserve and the national uh, accounts, why do they say you're less than half funded? And it comes down to this issue of how you're valuing your pensions liabilities. And this gets the, you know, the boring stuff, but it, but it really is very, very important. The key issue here is what people call the discount rate. If you think about, um, you know, most people know what compound interest is. Let's say you've got a dollar today and you add 5% each year, you add 5% this year, then another 5% to a next year, and so on, and you end up in the future with some <clears throat> large dollar amount. Discounting is really compound interest in reverse. You would take some future dollar amount, take interest off it each year in order to get what's called the present value. And this is, this is necessary because a pension is not just paying benefits this year, it's promised benefits you know, years and decades into the future. So you have to have, find some way of making these things comparable. Now, uh, most public sector pensions use a discount rate that's between 7 and 8%. Moser's is 7.25% now. Uh, and they base that on the investment return they, they assume they're going to get from the uh, the investments um, held by the plan. You know, they say, well, if we're going to get 7%, let's assume 7% discount rate. This is something which to the average person sounds completely rational. They'll say, well, why, you know, why would I, anybody do it differently than this? And to, to a certain degree, you'll have to take me on faith, but what I'll tell you is almost everybody does it differently than this. Uh, if you look at, um, I mean, example, uh, Ontario Teachers Plan, big Canadian teachers plan, they do essentially the same thing that a public employee plan here does. The Canadians are very similar to us. They take, you know, they invest in stocks and bonds, same as us. They're not assuming a seven and a quarter percent discount rate. They're assuming a 4.8 percent discount rate. Uh, if you go to Holland, most people say, you know, Dutch pensions are the best run pension plans in the world. Are they assuming seven and a quarter percent? No, they're assuming a two percent discount rate. You can go to uh, Australia. I mean, I've done some, some survey work in this, France, Finland. I mean, the, nobody is using discount rates as high as what the public sector pensions here are using, with one exception, with one exception. The, uh, the only pension, other pension system that uses these very high discount rates for valuing their liabilities, for setting their contributions, are what are called multi-employer plans. Now, Google multi-employer plans, you'll find you know, they're large plans, a lot of them here in the Midwest, and many of them are rapidly going broke. So you're, uh, the public sector pensions here are not in particularly good company. The upshot of people say, well, what, what's the difference between a seven and a quarter percent discount rate versus 4.8 percent versus two? It's it's kind of hard to to figure out the you know the meaning of this. So the upshot of it though is, let's say you have plans they promise exactly the same benefits. You know, the employees are working today. When they retire, they get to the penny the exact same benefits. The plan with a high discount rate, like the plans here in Missouri, like other plans around the country, will simply put aside much less money today to fund those future benefits than will a plan that uses a lower discount rate. You know, just uh, let's take the, the Canadian plan that uses a 4.8% you know, discount rate. For each dollar of promised future benefits, they will put aside about 80% more money, almost twice as much money as a US pension would here. Take the Dutch, they're putting aside more than four times as much money today to fund future benefits. And if you talk to people who are kind of, you know, pension, public pension industry, they kind of say, well, you know, low contributions, that's a good thing. Everything is done to keep the contribution low. And yet, when you think about it, you know, you say, well, why would you be doing that? You know, if you're a pension trustee, you're a fiduciary, your obligation legally, it's not to the government, you know, it's not to the taxpayer, it's to the people who are working uh, or you know, covered under the pension plan. Your obligation is to make sure their benefits get paid. So you would think their incentive would be to use, let's use conservative assumptions. Yes, let's use low assumptions on the rates of return we can get because that'll, that'll make the government put aside extra money today and I'll have make sure, you know, double sure we've got the money to pay the benefits we've promised. The reality is the, the pensions here do exactly the opposite. We put aside much, much less money to fund future benefits than do pensions in other countries. And these are public employee pensions, same as ours. They, we put aside much less money in state and local pensions than a private sector pension would have to do. And this, what this means is you're just, you're, 
You're, you're much more at the whims of the stock market. You're much more at the whims of what future generations are going to do because you've, you've secured much less money today in order to, to fund those future benefits. So it's the, getting back to this, the, the numbers I cited that show that uh, Missouri pensions are less than half funded, the Federal Reserve uses a 4% discount rate in doing that. The, the analogy is they're using the same discount rate that is used uh, when you value the, the liabilities of a private sector defined benefit pension. You know, if you're you know, General Motors or IBM, they, are, they have defined benefit plans. They use a conservative 4% discount rate to do it. You know, the, the Fed's belief is that we should do the same thing here. Now, it's, you know, when you present this in front of a pension crowd, you're like, well, how can you do this? I'll just give you, it's uh, the University of Chicago Business School. They do a regular survey of you know, prominent professional economists on you know, just issues of the day. Um, a couple years ago, they surveyed this group regarding these discount rates that public sector pensions here in the US use. And they said, the quote, they ask you, would you agree or disagree with the, this statement? And the statement is, quote, by discounting pension liabilities at high interest rates, many US state and local governments understate their pension liabilities and the cost of providing pensions to public sector workers. So they're presented with this. 49% of the economists surveyed agreed with that statement. Another 49% strongly agreed with the statement. So you, there was nobody among that group of economists who actually said, I disagree with that. So these are, you know, these are guys whose business it is to understand how this stuff is done. And almost none of them think that the way public sector pensions account for their liabilities and set their contributions is the correct way of doing it. So it's, yeah, this is, you know, the, they're scorn. This is this is an appeal to authority in the sense of, you know, if I were saying I'm the first guy ever to think of this, I want you to accept what I'm saying. Well, I mean, I could do that, and I could give you some very technical arguments about why I'm right and the other guys are wrong. What I am saying, though, is there's very many people who've thought through precisely this problem. The entire you know economics profession, you know, they've thought through this, and and they they think you need to use a much lower discount rate for these public pensions. Uh, the regulators for pension industry uh, think you should use lower discount rates. You know, the federal government, when they set regulations for the IBM or the General Motors pension, they say use a conservative assumption. Public employee plans in other countries, sometimes when you present this to people, they'll say, well, you know, we're a government plan. Your government has some magic where we, you know, we, we invest for the long term. You know, we can call on taxpayers, blah, blah, blah. And the answer to that is, well, look, there's, we're not the only government on earth. Um, there's lots of other governments. They have employees, and, and their employees have pensions too. How come they don't use these high discount rates, these very aggressive assumptions like we do? And the, and the answer is, to be frank, I think they're more responsible stewards of their money, uh, of their employees' money, than people are here. It's, you know, this is a, a sociological characterization, maybe. But I think here in the US, a lot of times we want to do things on the cheap. We want to say, we're going to promise you a generous benefit. We're going to guarantee you that benefit. But then we're not willing to pay up front what it really costs to do that. If you go up to Canada or you, you, know, you go to the Holland, where they're very good pensions, they're willing to pay that cost. And the, and the point of this is that policymakers should think carefully. They, they should promise what they can afford to pay. But then they should pay what they've promised. And what we've done here you know, in Missouri and really throughout the country is overpromise and underdeliver. We've, we've promised excessive benefits. We've raised benefits when times are good. And then we find we don't have enough money to, to pay it. And then a lot of governments skip their contributions. So it's, there, there's a bigger kind of issue here. And you know, to touch a little bit, you know, one, one of my hats is I'm a member of the, what's called the Financial Oversight and Management Board for Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, as you know, a lovely place, but bankrupt. And you know, I was put on there to help deal with the, the, the pension problems. And you know, they are now in a, an issue where you have, you know, and this is not a high income place, but you know, there's going to be cuts to benefits or retirees there because they've, they've essentially run out of money. The creditors, the bondholders can get much, much bigger cuts. But nevertheless, they've gotten themselves in a situation where it's, it's very tough to get out of that. And so the point is, and you know, when I when I started on this board, 
I went through and I found you know, memos from their actuary from 1970. And they said, you know, you're not contributing enough. Unless you double your contributions or cut back on benefits, you're going to run out of money. And instead, Puerto Rico said, well, we're not going to increase the contributions. Let's increase benefits instead. And you know, lo and behold, they ran out of money. Now, when, going back to this, this discount rate issue, it produces a kind of you know, sort of bizarre and I think uh, not healthy sort of kind of dynamic with how pensions set their policies. The way state and local pensions, they set their discount rate based on what they think they can get on their uh, investments. You know, if they think we're going to get seven and a quarter percent like Moser's, that's what they use. They discount back their uh, future pension benefit liabilities to today, and then they make a contribution based on that assumption. The upshot of this, though, is that a pension that takes more investment risk instantly becomes better funded under the accounting rules used. And because it's better funded, it can immediately cut uh, its contributions. The logic is that in, you know, in financial markets, you're rewarded for taking risk. So if, if a plan were to shift from holding mostly bonds to mostly stocks, that's a riskier portfolio. And so they can assume a higher rate of return on it. Well, a higher rate of return equals a higher discount rate. They can, that means a lower present value contribution or present value benefits. It means you immediately lower your contributions. Now, the result of this, you shouldn't, other, other pensions in other parts of the world, they don't do this. They're free to invest in stocks, they're free to invest in alternative investments, but they can't credit themselves with a higher return before they get it. So let's say they invest in risky assets and they get higher returns, that's great. Their assets go up because they have greater assets, then the unfunded liabilities goes down, they can reduce their contributions. Here in the US, we're very optimistic people, we credit ourselves with this higher rate of return before we've earned it. So that creates an incentive to take more risk. It's an incentive that exists here in the US, does not exist in private sector pensions, doesn't exist in most of these overseas pensions because they don't use this accounting system. It shouldn't shock you then, when we look at how different pension systems invest, US state and local pensions take a lot more investment risk than pensions in other countries. They take more investment risk than private sector pensions. Now, they're all funding the same benefits. You know, I mean, uh, uh, Ontario teachers, they're, look, they're a government pension, they got teachers. Why are they taking less investment risk? Is we have, we have incentives here that tell you taking greater risk means you're better funded. And this is the sort of thing where, you know, an, an economist would say, like, taking more risk means you're taking more risk. It doesn't, you know, a dollar of stocks is not worth more than a dollar of bonds. We have, you know, financial markets, people will pay a dollar for each. We know what they're willing to pay. And yet, to a pension, investing, holding stocks is supposedly much more valuable than holding bonds. It makes you better funded, it means you can contribute less. And this is just not a particularly, you know, great dynamic. And it's, it, it has led to, you know, problems, you know, here, it's led to even bigger problems in places like Illinois or California or, or wherever you are. Now, I'm going to switch on here. I switched back to my, sure, sorry. Let me talk a little bit about kind of, you've got unfunded liabilities for most of these plans. How are you going to, how are you to try to fix it? And there's really three ways you can do that. One is to increase contributions, more money going in. Another is to reduce benefits, which means either the initial benefit you get um, uh, is lower, you get a lower cost of living increase. Or a third way of doing it is to shift risk from the employer, from the government, to the employees. And some combination of these things is going to have to happen. You know, we have to have more money going in, less money coming out, or take some of the risk away. And you know, probably it is likely you're going to get a little bit of both, that the government's going to have to increase how much it pays in. Probably employees should have to pay more in as well. I mean, it's uh, Missouri, or Moser's at least, is unusual in that for employees hired before 2011, there's no contribution. That is almost unique around the country. In most state plans, employees pay about 6 or 7% of their salary into the pension. Here, most of the employees of Moser's are not paying anything. So yes, that should probably be increased. Um, uh, you know, COLA's, the, the COLA formula, again, for the, for the older employees is probably over generous. It should give you a, a larger COLA increase than, say, what you get on Social Security. That should probably be adjusted. But what I'd suggest is that 
a kind of a risk sharing approach may have some possibilities. Um, if you look at, say, Wisconsin or South Dakota, there's some other plans that use this, where benefits are adjusted based on the funding status of the plan. So you're sharing some of that risk between the employer and the employee. Say in Wisconsin, if the plan is well funded, you get a full COLA. If it's not so well funded, you get a smaller COLA. It's a, it's a similar process in South Dakota. The, the risk is an enormous part of the cost to the pension, to the government. And using these high discount rates, these accounting rules, the risk is literally being ignored there. But risk sharing is a way of, of trying to get these costs down while doing it in a way that is not crippling to people. You know, you'll notice, and, and, and here's, I think, the evidence for it. You know, I'm somebody, I have a 401k, people have 401ks, IRAs. Now, they have a choice. They could invest in safe assets in order to get a guaranteed benefit, but to do that, they would have to make very big contributions into the, into the account. Or what most people choose to do, they say, I'm willing to take a little bit of risk in order to get um, you know, lower contributions in or a higher expected benefit out. They're willing to live with some of that volatility. And I think if you were looking at how to reform the pensions here, that is something um, that's probably worth looking at as well. So I'll leave it at that, but I'm, uh, hopefully we can have plenty of time for questions at the end, because I know people like to talk about this. But thank you guys very much. Uh, I am the Deputy State Treasurer, and it is my job every morning to wake up and think about the financial problems uh, and financial issues facing the state of Missouri. And I think about those not just in a near-term basis, how we're going to pay the checks and how we're going to pay um, for other liabilities and how we're going to invest the state's money, but I think about our obligations years into the future. Uh, and in this particular case, I think about our obligations decades into the future. As the uh, Deputy State Treasurer, I have the great pleasure of uh, occasionally serving on the Mosher's board. The State Treasurer has a seat when he's unable to attend. I am his designee to the board, and through that, we've become very familiar with Mosher's and its financial problems. Two years ago, uh, when we took office, we started studying the issues that face Mosher's, and we became immediately alarmed. A little over a year ago, we addressed the Joint Committee on Pensions, and we said that this was a pension crisis facing the state of Missouri. Crisis is a word that we've gotten a lot of pushback over, but it is a crisis, and that's what I'm here to tell you about today, but I'm also here to deliver good news. The Mosher's Board has taken some actions within the past few months that put us onto a path of recovery, and in a few decades, um, hopefully Mosher's will be in a much better financial position than it's in today. The actuary report was delivered to us back in August, that's what I have here, and the actuary report paints a pretty grim picture, uh, and uh, I would like to walk through that picture now, and we're going to have some slides and charts. I have to warn you, this presentation was made for a non-technical audience, although given the topic, there's a lot of technical data embedded within it. Missouri has a AAA bond rating. We're extraordinarily proud of that. It is something that we cherish and it's something that we try to keep. And the reason that we try to keep it, and I get a lot of questions about this, is the state doesn't have that much debt, but the debt of our political subdivisions is closely tied to our bond rating as a state. So I used to be a school board member. Our school board's debt rating was tied to the state of Missouri's. So if Missouri's credit rating deteriorates, so does that of our political subdivisions, many of whom do have debt. So that is an incredibly important fact for the state of Missouri. I also say this because I would like to set up who our peer group is. Often in the public pension space, we hear inappropriate comparisons. We hear comparisons to Illinois or New Jersey or Kentucky. Well, uh, with all due respect to those states, we literally ran a campaign called Don't Be Like Illinois in the Missouri Treasurer's Office, and I'm pretty proud of that uh, campaign. And so uh, our peer group are the other AAA-rated states because that's the peers that we want to keep. That's the group we want to be in, and it's critically important that we do because our ability to fund our political subdivisions and our ability to pay our debts is tied to that AAA rating. Missouri has the lowest pension funding status of the AAA states. It's not even close. We sit at 64% funding on an actuarial basis, but the CPA in me believes that that's uh, sort of witchcraft, and I like to look at the market value basis. As of June 30th, we sat at 59% funding on a market value basis. This shows our valuation and our unfunded liabilities over time. 
In our office, I call this the mountain of debt. The unfunded pension liability has continued to grow uh, since early in uh, the last decade, and it is approaching $5 billion on a market value basis. Uh, it's perhaps over $5 billion, uh, depending on how the investments have done recently. So that is an enormous amount of money. If you divide that out per Missouri citizen, uh, depending on how you count, it comes to several hundred to several thousand dollars. The impact on the state finances is actually quite significant. The state of Missouri is typically responsible for 83% of Mosher's employer contributions. The rest of the contributions come from our so-called component units. Those are places like the University of Missouri that we're sitting at. In fiscal 2005, Mosher's received just under $200 million in contributions. Um, today, they're going to receive just under $400 million. Uh, so the contribution rates have grown steadily. I wish I could say that those contribution rates went to the costs of current employees, but they don't. The vast majority of those contribution rates go to pay off past obligations. And this is something that is a very grim message that I deliver today. I said I, at the start of this presentation that I worry about what affects the state of Missouri. I worry not just about our ability to pay for our obligations today, but our ability to pay our obligations in the future. We sit on a public campus tonight Tonight we will drive home, hopefully on clean roads from the snow that have been freshly salted and paved by uh, MoDOT, and we will encounter a various number of government services on our way home. If the pension obligations continue to rise, they will crowd out those other obligations, and it has a very real impact. The state budget is $28 billion a year, but the state discretionary budget, the part that Mosher's affects, is considerably smaller, because when you take out mandatory funding for programs like uh, Medicaid, and when you take out funding for programs that are dedicated in special revenue funds, uh, sources, special revenue funds and have dedicated funding sources, the percent of the budget that is truly discretionary, the, the part of the budget that the legislature has some room with, uh, it's actually remarkably small. And so as these pension obligations grow, they tend to crowd out other priorities. This is the contribution. As you can see, it's grown considerably over time. But while the picture that we have just painted is pretty grim, I will say there have been some positive events in recent months. Um, Dr. Biggs spoke uh, in a uh, fantastic way about the contribution rate, uh, or I'm sorry, about the uh, assumed rate of investment return. The assumed rate of investment return is uh, what got us into this crisis. People ask, um, what led to this? Well, I think there's two things that led to this. Unrealistic assumptions on the part of the Mosher's board, who for years they assumed that we were going to have an 8.5 or 8% investment return when the markets knew that that just wasn't going to happen. The 10-year annualized investment return is a little over 6%, but we were assuming we were going to get 8%. The difference is enormous. Uh, because each year we're losing ground based on our funding status. In July, the Mosher's board, uh, with a vote led by the state treasurer, lowered that to 6.95. Missouri has long been a leader in the pension space. We've led on various initiatives in the pension world, and we should be really proud of that. We've led on everything from um, anti-terror investing to how we disclose the fees uh, that our investments are earning. But we've actually lagged the rest of the industry in lowering the assumed rate of return. And as we hit 6.95, uh, that's actually a step in the right direction. It is Mosher's returning to being a leader in this space. It's not what we asked for. We asked for 6.75. The board was unwilling to go that low, even though we know that that's the more conservative approach, and even though we know that that's the approach that would give the state of Missouri a little bit more financial stability and a little bit more financial wiggle room in the future. But 6.95 is a good number. It's a number we're proud of. It's a number that wasn't planned when we came into office, and it's a number that if we can achieve those results, in the long term, Mosher's will be on a path to recovery. I was an accountant for, uh, I've been an accountant for a, a decade and a half or so, um, and I've seen a lot of good and bad financial decisions in my time. Uh, one of the worst financial decisions um, I've ever seen was actually the top bullet point on this slide. At the same time that the Mosher's board took the 
uh, initiative and the proactive approach to lower the assumed rate of investment return. They also voted to reset the pay down window from 26 years to 30 years. Now, that may not seem like a big deal, but here's the thing. I suspect some board members might try to do it again in the future. In, in real terms, this is sort of like if you had 26 years left to pay on your mortgage and you decided, I'm not gonna continue to pay over those 26 years, let's go back to a 30-year note. That's exactly what the Mosher's board did. Now, the thing is, for those of you that own a home, some people will just simply say the next year, well, let's refinance again and let's refinance again and keep doing it. If Mosher's keeps doing that, the obligations, the unfunded liability will continue to grow and it may never be paid off. If we can keep the course from 30 years from now, uh, the pension system will be paid off in 2049 and that's a good thing. But I suspect as the payments get painful, certain board members, hopefully not a majority of the board, will run and return to 30 years again and again. And that's one of the things about Mosher's that really bothers me. Mosher's unfunded liabilities are expected to peak in, 25, in 2025 at $6.2 billion. Uh, our plan's funding status will bottom out at 58.2% on an actuarial basis. Um, the primary driver of that is the actuarial smoothing that's going into how the plan is valued. Um, in 2049, in Mosher's employer contribution will reach $786.6 million, with the state uh, responsible for a sizable chunk of that. Um, 2049 is a long time away. I'm a young man. Mosher's will not be paid off when I'm eligible to retire, barring a uh, above average investment returns. So for me, this is very real. Under the old 26 year rule, it would have been paid off in the year of my retirement. Uh, with the 30 year rule, it will now not be paid off. Uh, and um, if they keep resetting it, then it won't be paid off either. This shows uh, a few different metrics. It shows the actual funding status of the unfunded liabilities. As you can see, the, uh, the, the obligation, the unfunded liability continues to grow. That's the large um, mountain. And then we will eventually be paying that off. This is how the employer contribution looks over time. The actuary's forecast assumes that investment returns are met every year uh, until the unfunded liabilities are paid off. We assume we're gonna earn 6.95%. Um, it's possible, it's doable. Uh, Mosher's has a very talented investment staff and uh, they have earned a little over 6% in the, in the last 10 years uh, per annum. But uh, the problem is um, investments come with a wide range of outcomes. So we may hit seven, we may hit eight, and that would be great, um, or we might come in less. And if we come in less, uh, the plan will not be paid off in 2049. Um, fundamental shifts in the market making it increasingly difficult for Mosher investments to achieve their target return. Uh, over the past 10 years or so, uh, we have seen extraordinarily low returns on um, bonds and other fixed income securities. Uh, we are coming out of that now. Um, I say is the, the guy who helps manage the state's $4 billion investment portfolio. But uh, that trend might continue into the future. Here are the actual Mosher's investment returns over time. The red line is the assumed uh, rate of investment return. Here are actual returns. As you can see in fiscal 2009, there was a sharp drop off. That's to be expected. And actually, I believe Mosher's did better than other plans during the, the financial crisis. Uh, since then, we've had some good years, we've had some bad years. The last few years have been particularly devastating, though, because while we saw a run-up in the stock market uh, starting in November 2016, and that run-up continued into the next several months, uh, Mosher's, unlike a lot of public plans, did not take advantage of that. Mosher's has recently taken steps to transition from the portfolio that they have to a more, um, quote-unquote, normal-looking portfolio. Um, and so our returns will be in line with much of our peer group going forward. Uh, this shows uh, the effects on the contribution rates of various um, assumed rates of investment return. Uh, just to wrap up for a moment, um, Mosher's has made a lot of progress in the past two years. And I do think that despite um, some of the doom and gloom talk that I just delivered, that that's worth noting. We have a new executive director who has made a lot of operational changes that are very positive. We are uh, moving towards a new investment portfolio that the board is extraordinarily happy with. We have a new investment advisor that we're uh, very happy with. We have a new actuary 
who I think will do a better job going forward of delivering um, more realistic assumptions to us uh, and then encouraging us to adopt those. Uh, we have a board who is extraordinarily financially savvy. I think this is probably one of the better boards uh, in Mosher's history. And we have a, a state, the employer here, that is willing to make these contributions and pay off this obligation over time. Uh, it's an extraordinary challenge, and it's a challenge that will last for decades, and it's a challenge that if we waver on even slightly, we may not achieve the results that we want. But uh, overall, I think Mosher's is trending in the right direction, even if we've had a bad decade and a half, and I think that that is a positive message that I can give you as citizens of the state of Missouri. So thank you very much. Good question. I think what do you, uh, a pay-as-you-go system like Social Security is one. There's no pre-funding. You collect taxes today and you use them to pay today's benefits. And I think the the reason you don't want to go that route with um, public sector pensions is simply that the cost would be prohibitive. I don't. I can't tell you. I mean, I could go to the actual evaluations for the Missouri plans, but nationwide, the average cost of paying current benefits. Uh, on a pay-as-you-go basis will be around 40% of employee payroll. That's well higher than the average contribution rate, say, for Missouri plans or most other plans around the country. And many states, even today, you know, 10 years past the recession, are not making their full um, contribution using the pre-funding schedule. So if you go pay-as-you-go, I mean, this, we found this in, um, in Puerto Rico. Once the assets ran out, you go pay-as-you-go, which is where we are now. It's very, very disruptive. So I think it's really just the cost is so high that if they can't make the current contribution, they can't make the pay-as-you-go cost. Uh, at this point, I would trade places with any of the AAA states. Um, Texas, I think Tennessee. Um, Wyatt, can you tell us the other nine? Uh, uh, Virginia, Maryland. Maryland Tennessee. Here, I'll put in a shameless plug. We have a, a website called Show Me Checkbook. We put all of the state's spending online. Uh, there is a comparison dashboard where you can compare Mosher's to the pension funding status of the other AAA states. They will all be on there except for Tennessee, who does a little bit of weird things with their uh, financial reporting. So I'm happy to trade uh, places with any of them because they all have a higher funding status than Mosher's. With Missouri, I don't know. I mean, there is the issue that the people on average are living longer, and in theory, the plan should account for that. I don't know. This gets down to like what life tables they're using. And I, with Missouri, I just don't know off the top of my head. But you have had cases of pensions. I think some of the Illinois plans have done this of using very outdated assumptions for mortality, assuming people are going to die younger than they actually will, um, and and that can have a big effect. I mean, if the Society of Actuaries changes their life tables to adjust them, this has a big effect on pensions. So it's important they they calculate it. I just don't know the answer specifically for your plan. Them. Yeah, and I don't know the answer uh, specifically for Missouri either. We did a, um, a full study of our various <laughs> um, inputs um, into our economic assumptions and other assumptions, but it was actually, I said a full study, it, we did a partial study that was not, to my knowledge, a part of it that we looked at this past year, and so that will come up on the next rotation, um, and we'll evaluate our experiences from there. So just on that point, so, so this, uh, the National Actuary Group publishes a, 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 an updated table, or is it the Social Security Administration? Who's yes. Well, there, there's various life tables. Social Security does one. Yeah. Society of Actuaries does another. I think the Society of Actuaries tables, it, it, and plans do their own based on experience studies. They look at their own population. Okay. But in general, the folks who are in defined benefit plans tend to be more educated, higher income people. So they're going to live longer yeah. than the general population. But both SSA and Society of Actuaries and you know, whatever firm you're using, they should update those things to keep track of it. In general, if, I mean, it, well, think of your own, if you're saving, you know, for retirement yourself, just as an individual. In general, people take more investment risk when they're younger, and they'll tend to take less, you know, as they approach retirement. And with a, with a defined benefit pension, that, that rule of thumb uh, is true as well. That as a pension ages, meaning it has more retirees, fewer workers, it should take less investment risk. And there's various sort of technical reasons for it, but that's the general rule of thumb for 
uh, for how a pension plan should work. You know, if you look at Society of Actuaries, Academy of Actuaries, you know, they'll, they'll tell you that. If you look at public sector plans in other countries, if you look at uh, private sector defined benefit plans, as their participants have gotten older, they've taken less investment risk. What do you think has happened with public sector plans, you know, state and local plans in the U.S.? Their population is getting much, much older. They're more retirees, fewer workers. They are taking a lot more investment risk today than they did before. And what this shows is they're, what they're doing is they're following the accounting incentives. The accounting incentive says if you want to be better funded, if you want to keep your contributions low, take more investment risk. That is outweighing the, the sort of the prudent approach, the actually approved approach of taking less investment risk as your population of participants gets older. The Society of Actuaries actually wrote a letter where they kind of took the public sector pensions to task and say, yeah, I forget the, the precise quote, but they said they're working contrary to just the basic precepts of how they should handle these things. And so it's, it, it is something, there is clear recognition among professionals who work in this, there is a problem with how we are sort of accounting for these pensions, and, how, and the accounting is driving behavior. And I think that's, that's an important thing. Could I touch on something quickly that, that came up in the previous presentation of the, the amortization period? This is, this is gobbledygook for most people. It's the period over which the plan pays off its unfunded liabilities. And previously, there were 26 years, and the, and the board of Moser's reset it and said, no, we're going to pay it off over 30 years. Now, the effect of that is to reduce the contribution. The board of Mosers, they are fiduciaries. They work for you, the participants. Their obligation is to the participants. They just told the government, no, you can redo it. We, we don't want the money. Instead of paying it over 26 years, you pay it over 30 years. I mean, why would they do this? If you're looking out for the people who are in the plan, you say, give me as much money today as you can. If you're a private sector pension, defined benefit plan, they usually have to pay off their unfunded liabilities. I think it's over seven years. Here we're at 26, and they're like, no, I'll spread it out to, to 30. It's, it is just something where I think they, instead of being kind of political players, just saying, hey, we're going to work with the legislature, we have elected officials, appointees on our boards, and they, they've just, I hate to say, take more seriously what they're doing. And what they're doing is they're promising people benefits in the future, and they're guaranteeing those benefits. You know, act like you're doing that. And so I think it's just it's a little higher level of seriousness. Frankly, all of them, because this is considered part of personnel costs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for, I mean, it's part of personnel costs. Missouri employees, this is something that gets said a lot around Jefferson City, and I don't know if it makes it up, up north here, but Missouri employees are the 50th lowest paid out of 50 states in the country. And one of the reasons for that is because our uh, money that would go to raises is being used increasingly to pay the previous generation of pension costs. So when I say all of the services, any service that relies on personnel costs, which is most state services, that's what's going to get crowded out because you're going to be able to spend less on salaries uh, in order to pay more for pensions. And so, um, you know, the, the legislature did not give state employees a raise last year. The legislature is giving $700 or 1% to employees this coming year, um, just 1%. Inflation is considerably more than that. Um, and the reason is because Mosher's uh, contribution rates have gone from below 20% to more than 20% at that time. So what services? I, I hate to say it because it's kind of a general answer, all of them. Well, I'm actually right now. <laughs> 